Good evening and welcome. My name is Jamie Boskett. I serve as the president and CEO of the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, and on behalf of our board of trustees, uh, many of whom are with us this evening, they've just completed their summer meeting, and uh, we'd, on behalf of this wonderful staff that have arranged for tonight's evening, we want to welcome you back to your State History Museum and specifically to the 12th annual uh, Hazel and Fulton Chauncey Lecture. Hazel and Fulton Chauncey, as many of you have heard us say before and with great pride, uh, were longtime supporters and members here of the VMHC and with a very special interest in the scholarly work of this institution. Their sons, Edwin Hall and Warren Fulton Chauncey, established this very lecture as a way to encourage the very same appreciation for history and history education in others, particularly in young people, that they saw in their parents. I'm very pleased, as always, that we have Warren with us tonight, and I'd like to embarrass him for a moment, ask him if he would please stand so we can show our collective appreciation for what he's done on behalf of his family. The Chauncey family's dedication to history and to this institution and the vision to create such a series that has become a hallmark of what we do every year is just such a lasting and wonderful gift. So thank you, Warren. Uh, speaking of traditions like this very series, it was our great pleasure, and some of you may have seen this in the paper or in other locations, just two weeks ago on July 4th, as we celebrated American independence, to host in this very room our Robbins Family Forum a citizenship ceremony welcoming 75 new people from 36 different countries. These Americans went through a long and arduous process to be here and to enjoy the great blessings of this great nation. And you could see the joy and the determination on their faces. It was, it's a magic moment every time we do it. And I would also note that on that very same day, you could see near the same determination on the face of many of us that are here at the VMHC. As we had the great pleasure on July 4th to officially launch our America 250th initiative. Believe it or not, in just three short years, we will mark this milestone in our nation, a once in a generation moment that brings with it countless, limitless opportunities for celebration, reflection, and aspiration as a nation. To kick off this 250th initiative, we proudly announced that longtime partner, the John Marshall Center for Constitutional History and Civics is now officially part of your State History Museum. This is a really rare merger of two beloved organizations to create an innovative new civic center and education center that will revolutionize the way we teach civics across the Commonwealth and beyond, empowering really history and civics, these fundamentally linked pieces, allowing them to work together to inspire and to educate current and future generations. We're really proud, and I think the potential there is almost limitless. Adding, of course, to this civics focus as we go ahead to the 250th, our ambitious plans include, in the next three years, a multi-year portfolio of major exhibitions, public programs, events, publications, and other far-reaching educational initiatives. You all have seen the wonderful growth and progress we've made, and it has positioned us in such a way to lead when it comes to the 250th. And, and lead we must, because I think we all, everyone here clearly has an interest in history, but we must embrace this historic moment of the 250th. It is, in many ways, extraordinary in our lifetime, and we must act upon it by together renewing this commitment we all should have to the unfinished pursuit of a more perfect union. Our American experiment is unique in human history, and we should always remember that. Unique in human history. It is a government of laws and not of individuals, a government by the people and for the people, founded on the self-evident truth that all are created equal and endowed with the universal rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, it, is, it is in our first two and a half centuries under the promise and ideas of our founding that our nation, and largely through the determination of its people, and with its unlimited capacity for reinvention and renewal, has progressed in this great journey, working to fulfill through struggle and sacrifice the promise of our founders for all Americans. We're a work in progress, you might say, but it's hopeful work, it is work worth doing, and is most certainly work worth celebrating. And so we are proud to be leading this effort here in Virginia and spreading across the nation 
to make sure that we as a country come together on the 250th and we mark this moment in a way that leads us forward stronger and better together. So I, I'll just pause. I get carried away, but I, I tell you what, you better get used to it because over the next three years, you're going to hear a whole lot of this from me and a whole lot about America. Uh, but what a great moment for us all to come together. On to tonight's program. And this is, of course, a very fitting one considering uh, what I've just shared. Tonight's speaker is an expert in American history from that period of around 1760 to 1877, and also in American constitutional and Southern history. Kevin Gutzman is professor of history at Western Connecticut State University and a faculty member at libertyclassroom.com. He has his law degree from the University of Texas Law School and his PhD from America, in American history from right here at the University of Virginia. Kevin has appeared frequently on C-SPAN, Fox News, and CNN. He's been interviewed by reporters from, from many major newspapers, including the New York Times and the Washington Post, and he is certainly no stranger to the VMHC. From 2020 to 2022, he served as a member of the Editorial Advisory Board, an incredible group of scholars that have helped with our Virginia Magazine of History and Biography. He's also an author of numerous published articles and uh, in that in other forms and has many books that many of you perhaps have read. Thomas Jefferson, Revolutionary. James Madison, The Making of America. Virginia's American Revolution, Who Killed the Constitution? And his most recent and the subject of tonight's lecture, The Jeffersonians, perhaps a culmination of sorts of your work, The Visionary Presidencies of Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. I wanna thank you all for your wonderful support of this institution. I uh, hope you know that we could not do any of what we do without you. So thank you for that. Thank you for being here. And if you would please join me in welcoming Kevin Gutzman. Thank you much. In 1798, former Congressman James Madison, who was already known as the chief author of the US Constitution, and the founder of the Jeffersonian Republican Party, decided to come out of retirement. He sought election to a new office, the lower house of the Virginia legislature. You might think, well, why would such an august person want to win appointment or win election to the lower house of the Virginia legislature? And the answer is that in 1796, in the presidential election, John Adams of Massachusetts had won two electoral votes from Richmond in the area around Richmond. And Madison intended to change Virginia's election law so that the electoral college votes would be cast, or would be, the electors would be selected on a statewide basis, winner take all, thereby, he hoped, denying John Adams two votes from the area around Richmond. <laughs> uh, more or less at the same time as this was going on, uh, a political ally of Jefferson and Madison in New York, one Aaron Burr, succeeded in shifting control of the New York legislature from the Federalists to the Republicans. And as the new uh, Republican majority had not yet convened, uh, the chief organizer of the other political party of the 1790s, Alexander Hamilton, wrote a letter to his friend, Governor John Jay. And he said Governor Jay should call a special session of the New York legislature before the new Republican majority took control and have it cast New York's electoral votes. And John, uh, John Jay wrote on the back of this letter from former Secretary Hamilton, quote, Re recommending to me a measure for party purposes, which I do not believe it would become me to adopt. And so New York did not change its electoral system in the run up to the 1800 election. As we know, this would be the margin of victory for the Jeffersonians in 1800. The election of 1800, 1801, is more often remembered as the election in which there was a tie between the two national Jeffersonian candidates, Virginia's Thomas Jefferson and the above mentioned Aaron Burr of New York. This freakishly was going to be decided by the outgoing Federalist majority in the House of Representatives. So there have been all kinds of rumors ever since 1800 and 1801 about what kind of backstage shenanigans went on as this question was pending, 
Um, a lot of people thought, well, it made sense that the Federalists would pick Thomas Jefferson. After all, everybody knew that he was supposed to have been the Republican presidential candidate. But others thought, well, nothing could be worse than this guy Jefferson. Even Burr is better than that. This was the Federalist attitude in New York. But Alexander Hamilton uh, intervened with his allies in the New York legislature and told them, I have no one in the world I should hate more than Thomas Jefferson, but yes, Burr is worse. Uh, because unlike Jefferson, Burr doesn't have a single principle. He's a creature entirely of ambition. We don't know where that would lead him. And so Jefferson it should be. Jefferson it ended up being. Uh, and one of the Federalists who were involved in this in the House of Representatives, a congressman from Delaware later said, that he had made an agreement through a proxy of Jefferson with the Republicans that he would cease voting uh, against Jefferson in return for their keeping some of his cherished Federalist program in place, that the debt would continue to be serviced, the Navy would not be completely eliminated, and uh, essentially the Republicans would not undo all of what the Federalists had done in the 1790s. Whether that's true is not entirely clear, but so he said, so he said. So what people tend to remember about this election is that there was this tie and there were 30 odd votes in that outgoing um, uh, Federalist House of Representatives, each state having one vote before finally Thomas Jefferson won the election. Another thing most people don't recognize is that Two Republican governors of states near the District of Columbia, including James Monroe of adjacent Virginia, were thinking about taking their state militias, marching them into Washington, and installing the people's choice, whatever the Congress might have decided. So this, this apparently was seriously considered, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen because, as I said before, in the end, Baird stopped voting against Jefferson, and Jefferson had beaten Burr. So there was going to be a significant change in the way the federal government worked. First, uh, Jefferson was, of course, going to follow the example set by George Washington in 1789 and give an inaugural address. People don't recognize that the Constitution doesn't say anything about having an inaugural address. This is one of the many examples of traditions that were picked up from Washington and have been carried on ever since. Uh, and Jefferson's inaugural address and his behavior on the day of his inauguration were going to mark historic change from the political culture and the political principles of the Federalist period before 1801. First, when the day came, Jefferson and local militiamen, a few local eminences walked up Capitol Hill on foot, they walked to where Jefferson was going to give his inaugural address. This was unlike what had happened the last time when John Adams had worn uh, velvet clothes and had a sword at his hip, had whatever few hairs there were on his head uh, pomaded, right? So, um, and, and both Adams and the other prominent Federalists went to the Adams inauguration uh, in carriage and six, right? And Jefferson was on foot. Uh, if you're old enough, you may remember in 1977, um, Jimmy Carter got out of his limousine on the way to the White House and walked through the District of Columbia. And some people said, this is like what Jefferson did. It was like what Jefferson did. It was like what Jefferson did. And it, that was not the end of the change in um, the tenor of the federal government in the Jefferson administration. Jefferson intended for the federal government to be more democratic, not only in its policies, but in its culture. And that was one example of that. Um, Jefferson's first inaugural address, I tell my undergraduates, is one of the few inaugural addresses in American history that are actually worth reading. So there may be three or four of those. Um, Jefferson's first inaugural address is characteristically poetic. It sharply defines what the Republicans' principles are, and 
he, of course, and all the people around him could not have known that what he was doing in that inaugural address was laying out the program that he and his two close allies, successors in the White House, were going to follow for the next 24 years. Essentially, they're going to implement all of it. Some of it was a spectacular success. Some of it was, I think we'd have to say, a debacle. And we'll come back to that. How did people respond to this first inaugural address? Well, Jefferson had an ally in DC who that morning uh, printed copies of his inaugural address to hand out after the inauguration. This must have happened at a late hour before the inauguration too, because apparently the first draft of Jefferson's inaugural address mentioned both Washington and Adams and said positive things about them to the effect that he, Jefferson, knew that it was not often going to fall to the person who was leaving the office of the presidency to be held in the same esteem as he had known before he'd entered it. And of course he meant both Washington and Adams. And then he went on to say positive things individually about Washington and Adams. But when he got up that morning, he heard that John and Abigail had already fled town. So apparently then he scratched out the part about Adams. <laughs> and well, I was gonna doff my hat to you, but look how you're acting. So. So it ended up with only a statement about the eminent place that George Washington held in everyone's heart, which um, of course is an ongoing reality. So uh, Jefferson's political program he laid out in that first inaugural address had a few major uh, themes, a few major uh, principles. One was that uh, the United States would prefer to have, these are of course Jefferson's famous words, peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, entangling alliances with none. He thought that if you had foreign countries as your friends, you got their enemies too, and that would be expensive. It would lead to more centralization of the government. It would mean you'd have war more often. All of these he thought were things to be avoided, and how would you avoid them? Well, you just kind of wish them away by not being involved, and we'll see how that worked out. Um, <laughs> Jefferson also said <clears throat> that the new government was going to be more or less straightened. That is, he didn't want to take, he said, from labor the bread it has earned. So low taxes were going to be one of the central goals of the Jeffersonians in office, low taxes. If they weren't as low as could be, well, why not lower than they were? That was, that was their ongoing principle. Um, Jefferson entered office at the head of a network of connections. This is something people don't often recognize. Of course, when he took the oath of office, he took it from the recently uh, uh, sworn in Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall, his cousin. And when Jefferson uh, had the chance, he immediately appointed his best friend in the world, James Madison, to be Secretary of State. And then the party leader of the Republicans in the House of Representatives was another Jefferson cousin, John Randolph, when he had a chance, the first time he had a chance, he appointed to the Supreme Court John Blair from Albemarle County. So this, actually, there are several more kind of waves of people who were in some sense related to the leading Jeffersonians too. For example, Dolly Madison had numerous cousins in the House of Representatives, a brother-in-law in the Supreme Court. Uh, I could go on and on about this. The point is, this is a very small group. And they're not only politically congenial, they're, they're closely tied to each other. Um, the cabinet, the way, the, the way that Jefferson's policy making was going to work was entirely unlike the way it works now. The cabinet still was only a handful of people. And in Jefferson's administration, they, the people in the cabinet were going to be his closest advisors, especially the two top people in the cabinet, Madison and uh, Pennsylvanian, immigrant from Switzerland, Albert Gallatin. Gallatin had come to be a prominent Republican in the 1790s because he was the one Republican who could actually dispute financial matters with Hamilton. So I had occasion many years ago when I had a fellowship here to do some research about 1790s Virginia politics and I came across a letter in the, the local collection from one John Taylor of Caroline, another prominent Virginian in the Jeffersonian era. And he was writing to a friend and saying, after decades of bewailing the Federalist fiscal policy and their banking and so on, 
uh, Taylor said to his friend, you know, I don't really know how banks work. Like, how, how does this even work? So they, they sincerely did not understand what they were arguing about, some of them. Gallatin, on the other hand, he, he uh, kind of rooted out some of the main problems that have developed in the banking operations in the federal government and beyond in the 1790s. And often, if you hear people say anything about um, Andrew Jackson, the libertarians, for example, ask him, what, you, what positive thing do you have to say about Andrew Jackson? And they would say, what would a libertarian like about Andrew Jackson? And the answer you might get would be, well, he paid off the debt. But it's true that Andrew Jackson was president on the day the federal government's debt was extinguished. So for that long, there was no federal debt at all. That was precisely the day that Albert Gallatin's plan had called for paying off the debt. So what Jackson did was make the payment the day that Gallatin had scheduled it. And this was the fulfillment of one of those main principles of the Jeffersonian party that I mentioned a minute ago, right? So these people, uh, they were ideological and they meant it. It was not a campaign platform. It was, it was their a reflection of their actual beliefs about the way government ought to work. So back to the cabinet, you have Jefferson, Madison, Gallatin, a uh, kind of rotating roster of other people. Jefferson, looking back on these things later, of course, older people might tend to think of things in a rosier light than they had actually been in, but it seems to have been true. He said, Jefferson did, in eight years of my administration, we never had a serious disagreement in the cabinet. We would just bring up a question, we'd talk about it, and eventually we'd agree. And that was apparently the way things worked. Right. Well, if you know anything about Jefferson's personality, you know, that's kind of the way he liked to understand himself or his relationships with other men he esteemed. So maybe that's the way it worked. Maybe it isn't. But we didn't have a lot of dissension, at least that the public was aware of during the Jefferson administration. Jefferson also thought that one element of his presidency ought to be, <coughs> excuse me, Periodic statement or periodic uh, issuance of, for the public's benefit of important statements of principle. So one of those was a uh, response to a complaint he received from the merchant community in New Haven, Connecticut. You might think New Haven, Connecticut, how, how significant is that? There were, going, there were going to be two states that voted against Jefferson all three times he was a presidential candidate. One was Delaware and the other one was Connecticut. And what was it about Connecticut? Well, if you know anything about Connecticut, you know it was founded to be more of Massachusetts. As one of John Winthrop's sons was responsible for the establishment of Connecticut and what it was supposed to be was another uh, Puritan colony. And by the time Jefferson was president, it still was the case that the wealthiest people, the most politically prominent people in Connecticut were also the leaders of the Congregationalist Church in Connecticut. And when Jefferson came into office, he explained that what he found was that everybody who had been appointed to an, an appointed of office in the executive or the judicial branch during the Federalist uh, presidencies had been a Federalist. And so what he did was he made a change in one of the appointed positions in New Haven, which is the port city near New York in Connecticut. And the New Haven merchants sent him a petition complaining about this, telling, him, telling Jefferson how worthless this fellow was they had, he had appointed and how nobody approved and so on. Jefferson answered by saying, well, you know, you just elected him to be a judge and he's also one of your representatives. And do you really think he's worthless? This can't be the, true, the case. And he also said, it's not going to be anymore that everybody in the federal government's a federalist. It just can't be. Now, what he did not have in mind was a kind of Jacksonian era system in which, uh, say, a Republican wins the election and when he comes in, he sweeps out all the Federalists. He fires every postmaster in America, every tax collector in all the ports. That was not what he had in mind. But he said, he, ultimately, there ought to be some kind of relationship between the percentage of people who vote Republican and the percentage of appointed people who are Republican. How could you object to this? So the idea here was to make this long statement um, laying out his principles, not for the benefit of New Haven merchants. As I said, they were still gonna vote against him for president one more time. But to tell the country, this is the way we think public administration ought to work. It ought to reflect the people's will. If two thirds of us are 
voting Republican, two thirds of the appointees ought to be Republican. But that doesn't mean none of them should be Federalist because some people are still voting Federalist, right? This is the way it ought to look. Um, the Jefferson also more famously made such a pronouncement in response to another group in Connecticut, the so-called Danbury Baptists. Now the Danbury, it happens at the university where I teach is in Danbury. The Danbury Baptists are not a community of Baptists in Danbury. <laughs> Or at least at that time, the Danbury Baptist Association was not a, a, a Danbury uh, congregation of Baptists. Instead, it was what might be called a presbytery. It, it had over a dozen local communities of Baptists from the Hudson River Valley in New York, about two thirds east in Connecticut to Middletown. And they occasionally would get together for various purposes. And when Jefferson had been elected, they wrote him a letter and said how happy they were to see that somebody who believed in the principle of freedom of conscience was now going to be at the head of the federal government. And of course, you could read this as a slam uh, at the Federals who ran the Connecticut government. And famously, Jefferson wrote back to them and said that he hoped eventually it was going to be the case that all the states would adopt what Virginia already had adopted, which was a, uh, a formal policy of letting people have freedom of conscience. That this was uh, an idea on which Americans generally agreed, even if the, there was some kind of inertial resistance to it in a couple of holdout states. So this was another way that Jefferson thought the executive ought to um, fill his function. It wasn't only that he was the head of the government, it also was that he had this kind of teaching role, whether he'd wanted it or not. When the election was being held in Virginia, when at the end of 1800 people were voting, um, there rose in the area right around uh, Richmond, several counties around Richmond, and all the way down the James to the Atlantic, what we think was the biggest slave conspiracy in American history. Some people said there was as many as a thousand slaves involved in this conspiracy. And what the conspiracy was about was an attempt to overthrow the slave system. And apparently the target of this uh, conspiracy was the governor of Virginia, James Monroe. So some of these people were found out. Uh, there began to be trials in Richmond. Some of these people were acquitted. Actually, most of them had able legal representation. You were more likely to have able legal representation if you were a slave who had been accused of something like this than you were if you were a white man because your master could probably afford it. So there were some of these people who were accused of being involved in Gabriel's conspiracy who were acquitted. There were some who were convicted and pardoned. There were some who were hanged. After this had gone on for a while, of course, the governor had called out the militia in numerous counties. He'd called out cavalry militia and had them come to Richmond to guard the Capitol in his, his own mansion. And then he wrote a letter to his political patron, Vice President Jefferson. And he said, we've had this terrible problem here, and I don't really know what to do about it. It seems to me that it doesn't even make sense to be punishing it the way we are, but this is what the law says. And Jefferson wrote back to him and said, well, in the area around, um, around Monticello, we have the feeling there have been hangings enough. There have been hangings enough. And this, the, the editor of Monroe's papers says this first correspondence, mar this correspondence marks the first time we know of in which Governor Monroe said he looked forward to the day when there would not be slavery in Virginia. And Jefferson said the same thing. So then they got to the question, okay, if we... If we have this feeling about these events, what can we do about them? And Jefferson said, well, I have the idea that although we have to treat these people as criminals, notice he says we have to treat them as criminals, not that they are criminals, because after all, what do they do? They, they don't want to be slaves. We wouldn't want to be slaves. Jefferson says, maybe we could find someone to, somewhere else to say them. It could be, for example, that a colony in the Caribbean, um, people there might think these men were heroes. In fact, they'd probably make good citizens. And Monroe said, I think they'd make good citizens too. And so they, they contacted the government of Great Britain and they asked about sending some of these people to Sierra Leone and recently established colony in West Africa to which slaves uh, in similar situations are being sent by the British. And the British said, well, I'm afraid we can't take these people there right now because we just had a slave uprising in Sierra Leone. <laughs> 
So what ends up happening as a result of these events is that both Jefferson and Monroe are dedicated to the idea of taking significant action against slavery. And we're going to see the rest of what I'm saying tonight that they did, both of them, take very significant action as president against slavery. Um, besides these events that I've described already in the Jefferson administration, of course, the most significant, the most important one in our recollection is the Louisiana Purchase. Louisiana Purchase was a result of what Jefferson had long seen as an important uh, diplomatic imperative of the United States. So he wrote to a friend long before he was president, there is on the map one spot, the possessor of which must be an enemy of the United States, and that is New Orleans. So he had his minister in Paris talk to the French foreign minister about the idea of buying New Orleans. And if you know about this period, you, you know about the French foreign minister, Talleyrand, who I think is one of the most interesting people in world history. He was, he was foreign minister under the old regime, and he was foreign minister in the revolution. He was foreign minister under Napoleon. He was foreign minister after Napoleon. How could he do this? Anyway, so Livingston says to him one day that his government, Livingston's, Jefferson and Madison, would like to buy New Orleans. And supposedly Talleyrand looked for him a minute and looked at him for a minute and then he smiled and he said, suppose I were to sell you all of Louisiana. Now, Louisiana did not mean the state of Louisiana. Louisiana in those days included the whole Gulf Coast of Alabama and Mississippi, plus Louisiana east of the Mississippi River and from the mouth of the Mississippi all the way up into Canada. But so it was this gigantic area and you can kind of imagine Livingston, he's a diplomat. And Talleyrand says this to him. And surely he must have felt his jaw slacken. Uh, but, but he's supposed to keep a straight face. So he said, I think my superior would be interested in that idea. And supposedly Talleyrand smiled at him and said, well, what would you pay us? And uh, Livingston offered him $10 million which in those days were a mint. Federal government's budget was under $20 million. Imagine that, by the way. Um, so so he, he offers him $10 million and Talleyrand says, well, that's far too little. How about if you think about it and come back and we'll talk about it again tomorrow. That night, James Monroe arrives in France. Um, he's been sent by Jefferson and Madison, the Secretary of State, to join Livingston in this negotiation. So the two of them talk about this, and they decide, well, okay, they will agree to spend $50 million on this. And of course, they have no authority to buy anything more than New Orleans. They have no authority to spend $50 million. Unbelievable. But they are sure that their superiors, Jefferson and Madison, will like this idea, which indeed they do. So the word gets back to the United States. Oh, by the way, there's later going to be argument about the question, how much, how much credit Monroe deserves for all this, right? That's going to be an electoral issue later. Um, but anyway, the word of this gets back to the United States. Secretary of State Madison is giddy. And you can't really imagine Secretary of State Madison being giddy. <laughs> if you know him, you think, giddy, really? Uh, does that mean he tried to make two chess moves at once? Uh, that, um, but anyway, um, he's giddy. And they run this by, he and Jefferson run this by other prominent Republicans. They all like the idea. Um, Jefferson and Madison, meanwhile, talk about this. And Jefferson says, well, what about the constitutional issue? Now, so far as I know, and I think I'd know, there's only one prominent Republican who thinks there's a constitutional issue. We do have a diary entry from John Quincy Adams, who by this time is a disaffected former Federalist Senator from Massachusetts, who says that while this question was pending in Washington, he went and talked to Secretary of State Madison. And he said to Secretary of State Madison, how about if I propose a constitutional amendment in the Senate empowering the president to buy territory from France? And Madison says, I don't think we need to do that. And Quincy Adams says, but isn't it unconstitutional? Isn't it 
against the principle that you guys laid out in the 1790s that the federal government only had the powers that were expressly granted. There's no express grant of power to buy Louisiana or any other place, certainly not ultimately to make it into states. And Madison told him, according to John Quincy Adams' diary, if I were on the floor of Congress right now, I don't think I could argue that the president had authority to do this. But we don't want an amendment. Why didn't they want an amendment? Well, they'd run the idea of an amendment past a couple of Republican senators and been told, if you run that idea past, a couple, uh, past the Senate, there are going to be people who latch on to this idea of a constitutional problem and use that to drag this out. And meanwhile, another letter comes across the Atlantic. Apparently, Napoleon has told Livingston, remember, he's the ambassador, we'd call him now, to France, you better hurry up. Actually, I'm not sure I really want to do this. Maybe I'm going to go back on it. And we don't, we of course can't tell whether Napoleon was really thinking, hey, I don't want to do that. That was a bad idea. Or he's thinking, if I tell them I'm about to change my mind, they might hurry up and give me my money. Right? Whatever their whatever his reasons were, Jefferson, while this was going on, it took weeks and weeks for the letter to come across the Atlantic. Um, Jefferson had told Madison, draft me an amendment. And then he, Jefferson, had scribbled about an amendment. And then one of their uh, allied senators told them, you can't do this. If you mention this, if you try to have a debate on it, it's going to bollocks the whole thing. So finally, Jefferson says, well, sometimes if you're the chief executive, you just have to do things on the spur of the moment and hope that people will forgive you. So that was the constitutional basis of the Louisiana Purchase. However, notice the Louisiana Purchase made the Republicans invincible. This was the solution to everybody's problems. This was manna from heaven. This was more than you could imagine. Oh, back to Connecticut, where I'm a professor. By the time Jefferson became president, essentially all of the arable land in Connecticut was being farmed. So that if you were the typical man and woman in Connecticut who had 12 pregnancies and ended up with 10 or 11 kids and four or five of them were boys, when they got to adulthood, you're going to have to say to three or four of those boys, sorry, we don't have any land for you. But now you could say, go to Ohio, farm all you want, right? So ultimately, this is going to be the, the buttress to what's going to become the uh, invincibility of the Republican Party. And again, it really it amounted to uh, kind of a flouting of Jefferson's own stated basic constitutional principle. Another theme or another underlying current uh, in this period was ongoing conflict between the Jeffersonians and Jefferson's cousin, John Marshall, and the, his majority on the Supreme Court. The Marshall Court is duly named, right? Nowadays, people refer to the, the Roberts Court or the Waite Court or the Warren Court or the Burger Court. And what does that mean? That means that was the name of the Chief Justice. But when John Marshall was Chief Justice, he was the court. There would be entire terms of court when he wrote every majority opinion. And he would read the opinions. He would read them all when they became public. It was his voice. Usually it was his writing. And uh, we have only one time in his whole tenure from 1801 to 1835 when he dissented in a constitutional case. Right? So the court always took his position, essentially. The court virtually always took his position. And over and over again, he and Jefferson, especially, but also Madison and Monroe, were going to butt heads over the meaning of the Constitution. Because more or less everything Jefferson had said in that first inaugural address was contrary to John Marshall's understanding. John Marshall had ended the Adams administration simultaneously as Secretary of State and as Chief Justice. And then, as I said before, he swore in his cousin to be president. And... <laughs> On their way out the door, the uh, outgoing Federalist majorities in Congress and the outgoing Federalist president created several new judicial posts in the federal government, and they hurried to fill them. And people have long said that the idea of these as the midnight judges, which they were hurrying to fill to try to thwart the Republicans' program, that this was political propaganda. But we know it's true because one of the Federalist senators one of the most prominent Federalist senators, Governor Morris, who was a senator from, New from uh, Pennsylvania, even though he was from New York, uh, 
uh, said at the time, well, uh, as the gale is blowing us, uh, we're going to have to attach an anchor to keep it from moving too far. In other words, the, the whole point of, of creating these new judicial posts was to provide an obstacle to implementation of the Republican program. That's not just political propaganda. That's what Morris said. And he was the chief movers of it. So um, Jefferson said in his, his autobiography, which he wrote when he was in his 70s, so 20 odd years after this, that when he came into office, when he took the oath, he went to the Secretary of State's office. And of course, there was not yet a new Secretary of State. And he found on the Secretary of State's desk a stack of commissions. That is a stack of the certificates that you give to an appointed official to show that he's been appointed. And Jefferson says in his autobiography, I immediately decided not to deliver them. I immediately decided not to deliver them. Now, what the, arg what the dispute is going to be about in the Supreme Court in the famous case of Marbury, who was one of these judges who were supposed to have been appointed by the president leading to the signing of one of those commissions, Marbury and Madison, the Secretary of State, the executive branch official who, if anyone, would have been the one to deliver Marbury's commission to Marbury, uh, what the suit came down to was a question, at least as Chief Justice Marshall cast it, whether delivery of the commission was required to make it effective. In his opinion for the court in Marbury versus Madison, uh, Chief Justice Marshall said, no, delivery of the commission wasn't required to make it effective. All the Constitution said about appointing judges was that the president could appoint them with the advice and consent of the Senate. And Marshall for the court said that this meant that the president make a nomination the Senate would then confirm the appointment, and that was all that was required. But Jefferson said, no, this is like a deed for sale of land. And if you're a lawyer, you know, a deed for sale of land is not effective until it's delivered. So I could, so I could decide to convey my house to you. I could sign a deed. And then if I didn't give it to you, nothing, legally nothing had happened. And Jefferson said, well, this is the same kind of circumstance. What Marbury versus Madison uh, established in constitutional law was the fact that federal judges are going to have what we call the power of judicial review. That is the power to decide whether a federal statute is unconstitutional. Um, but the, the reason why the, the Republicans were unhappy with Marshall about Marbury, Marbury versus Madison was not that they didn't like the power of judicial review. Jefferson, in talking James Madison into sponsoring amendments to the Constitution in the first federal Congress, had said to Madison, among other things, just imagine what Pendleton, With and Blair, Virginia's three leading judges at the time, just imagine what Pendleton, With and Blair could do with good amendments, right? With a bill of rights, imagine what they could do with it. So Jefferson was saying, think how great judicial review would be if we had a bill of rights and good judges. So he was not against judicial review. None of the Republicans opposed judicial review. What they didn't like about what, what Marshall did in Marbury versus Madison was that he started by asking whether Marbury had a right to this commission, whether there was a remedy, and only at the end did he get to, do we have jurisdiction to hear this case? Today, if you're a lawyer, you know, the federal rules of civil procedure say if you're if you're instigating a if you're initiating a suit in federal court, you have to begin by pleading to the jurisdiction. So that's the first thing the judge is supposed to consider. If he doesn't have jurisdiction, that's supposed to be the end of it. But what Marshall did in Marbury versus Madison was he he went through this whole long lecture about how poor Marbury has a right to this and there is a remedy at law but I just can't make those scoff laws Jefferson and Madison give the poor man his commission. Fortunately, we have the power of judicial review, and we know that Congress's attempt to give us jurisdiction over this kind of case is unconstitutional, right? So here we have how the first of what are gonna be several instances of headbutting between Marshall and the leaders of the, of the Republican uh, legislative and executive branches during the Jeffersonian era. There are going to be several other such instances, several of them. In fact, if you study constitutional law in a push or as an undergraduate or in law school, you start with Marbury versus Madison. And next up is McCulloch versus Maryland. The, the 
the decision from the Marshall Court that just made Virginia Republicans apoplectic. The chief judge of the Virginia Court of Appeals wrote numerous uh, newspaper editorials in the Richmond Inquirer about McCulloch versus Maryland. Jefferson privately egged him on. Write more, write more. Um, other judges attacked Marshall about McCulloch versus Maryland. And they're going, there's going to be a kind of back and forth between people in the elected branches and Chief Justice Marshall through this whole period, because what Marshall is doing is he's, he's as I said, he's writing the fundamental decisions into what we call constitutional law. He's, he's writing the Hamiltonian position on the Constitution into the way that people in the legal system treat the Constitution today. So Jefferson ended up concluding in the 18 teens that he thought that the, the chief flaw of the Constitution was it didn't give the Republican elements of the federal government any way to correct the judges. If Marshall and his majority um, were to uh, write Hamiltonian principles into constitutional law, there was nothing the elected branches could do about it. At one point, <clears throat> Former President Jefferson got so annoyed about this that he wrote to one of his appointees on the Supreme Court. And he said, how is it, no matter how much we change the material, we still end up with the same loaf, right? In other words, I made appointments, Madison made appointments, and it's still John Marshall, right? Why don't, why don't you ever dissent? How come there's never even a concurring opinion? And so this fellow, a South Carolinian named William Johnson, wrote back to Jefferson and said, well, OK, that's that's maybe that's a reasonable objection. But I don't think we've been wrong about any of our constitutional. Opinion. Can you tell me which of my constitutional opinions I've been wrong about and or which of our constitutional opinions we've been wrong about? And Jefferson wrote him back just an endless letter talking about like 20 of these opinions. Right. And and so Johnson answers, OK, well, I think from now on, if I think that the court is wrong, I'll write, a, I'll write a dissent. And today, Justice Johnson is remembered, and in fact, there's an excellent book about him published on the University of South Carolina Press about 1958, I think, called The First Dissenter. And how did Justice Johnson become the first dissenter? Well, he would, he would, uh, he would dissent once, maybe twice in a term, and that made him the great dissenter of the early period. So you see how much Marshall just completely controlled the Supreme Court. They were saying what he wanted them to say. And Jefferson couldn't stand it, right? He could see where this was going to go, which was uh, to a situation in which the federal government behaved in a way totally unlike what he would have preferred. Um, so Jefferson ends up being reelected in 1804, of course. He's reelected in all but Connecticut and Delaware for, are for him. And you might think, well, that's it, the world is his oyster. But there ends up being a major division among the Republicans, what's called the quid schism, the quid schism. This is led by uh, another one of those Jefferson cousins I mentioned before, John Randolph of Roanoke. And John Randolph of Roanoke and the chief judge of the Virginia Court of Appeals, Spencer Roan, and John Taylor of Caroline, uh, and some other like-minded people are unhappy with the Republicans. They're unhappy with the administration. They're not unhappy with Jefferson. They think the problem is James Madison. They think the problem is that James Madison isn't really a Jeffersonian. At one point, John Taylor was, was reading, apparently he'd been reading the Federalist Papers. And he wrote a letter to a friend and he said, I've been reading this Federalist. And I think I have a few questions I could ask Mr. Madison, right? So he thought, he, of course, didn't know which of those essays had been written by Madison and which by Hamilton and Jay, but he thought that the uh, Republican executive was not behaving in as purely Jeffersonian a way as he would have preferred. And rather than blaming the fellow at the top of the, top of the heap, he blamed Madison for it. And there ends up being what's called the quid schism. If you were John Randolph of Roanoke and you were going to be a third something, not a Federalist, not a Republican, but some third something, you would call yourself a tertium quid because that's exactly what kind of a demagogue you were, right? That Randolph's attitude was, if you're not educated and you don't understand what that means, too bad for you, right? That's not my problem. I'm just a U.S. representative. Um, but his, his attitude was that the, the federal government had too often, the federal executive, he thought, had too often, 
taken measures that tended to increase the power of the federal executive. And he did not like this. He thought that was contrary to the promises the Republicans, Republicans had made when they were out of office. And so he organized opposition to the Jeffersonians. This is going to be a theme through the rest of the era, too. It starts toward the end of the Jefferson administration. But once Jefferson's out, uh, all of these people feel at liberty to take their shots at President Madison. One person who maybe is surprisingly a, a kind of short run convert to their cause is James Monroe. James Monroe had been uh, a kind of client of Jefferson's. Well, when he was a young man, he was actually a kind of law student of Jefferson's. And then he had been somebody who was ushered into top jobs with the understanding of people in Richmond, for example, that Jefferson and Madison would like him to be elected governor. And uh, ultimately, Jefferson sent him to England with another fellow, William Pinckney, to try to try to negotiate some kind of end to what amounted to all but armed hostility between the United States and Britain. And they did negotiate a treaty. It was called the Monroe-Pinckney Treaty. It included uh, an agreement by the British to end all the commercial discrimination they were carrying out against the Americans, to open their colonies to American shipping, to take measures that would have made America substantially better off. But what it did not include was the provision that President Jefferson had told negotiator Monroe was the sine qua non of a treaty he would accept, and that was an agreement to stop the practice of impressment. Impressment was the British practice of stopping American ships interrogating the sailors in those ships, identifying those that were considered to be English, not American, and forcing them into the Royal Navy on the spot, impressing them on the spot. There were dozens and dozens of cases like this. When I talk about this in Connecticut, I tell my students, uh, and one of them was of a fellow who was born right here in Danbury, Connecticut, where my college is located. So what it, Obviously, predictably, what happened was that some of these people who were impressed were not actually British. Some of them were really native-born Americans. Some of them were people who had emigrated to the United States and become citizens. But the British, like the French, like the Austrians, like the Russians, did not recognize the idea that somebody could be an emigre, that you could cease to be British and become American. That was just nonsensical. So if you were born British, you remain British, whatever the Americans might think. And this went on for a long time. So anyway, Monroe and Pinckney negotiated a good commercial treaty between the U.S. and Britain, except it didn't address this impressment question. When Jefferson got the treaty, he wrote back to Monroe and he said, uh, you know, a lot of people here thought, think that the British drove a really hard bargain and they got more or less everything they wanted, which you might see as insulting if you were James Monroe. James Monroe did see this as insulting. And for a for a while, he became the, the great hope of the quids. So he's a kind of temporary uh, recruit to these, the schismatic group among the Republicans because they thought Jefferson was not being Jeffersonian enough and it was Madison's fault. And now here, look what they're doing to our guy, Monroe. Maybe Monroe would be a good president. Maybe he should succeed Jefferson, not Madison. This was an idea that was in the air. And actually, Monroe thought... He, he believed that the reason Jefferson did not accept the Monroe-Pinckney Treaty because, was because he didn't want to put another feather in Monroe's cap even, just as the question who should be his successor was coming up. So Monroe believed that this was about angling for James Madison to succeed Jefferson. I think it's, that's unfair. We know that Jefferson told him, look, I won't accept any treaty that doesn't agree to end impressment, that doesn't include an agreement to end impressment. Anyway, for the short term... The two of them are going to be allied. Ultimately, in 1808, Jefferson wrote a letter to Monroe and said to him, look, you have new friends. They are not leading you in a good direction. You are not going to like the outcome if you continue on this path. And so Monroe decided that he would accept election to be the governor of Virginia again. In those days, they had a one-year term. So he, he would accept election again. And in order to do that, he was going to have to tell the leaders in the legislature that he supported the, the uh, administration in Washington. He would do that on the ground that, of course, they would still understand that he 
adhered to all the foreign policy principles he had stood for before, right? In other words, I still think the Monroe Pinckney Treaty was a good idea. Uh, and that night, uh, the night that he learned of this, John Randolph Roanoke, the organizer of the quids, wrote in his diary the date, Richmond, James Monroe, traitor. Uh, James Monroe, traitor. Uh, John Randolph, you didn't want to get on his bad side. We'll come back to that. Um, anyway, Jefferson accepts this idea. Monroe's again elected governor. Jefferson's administration in its last couple of years, the, the central policy development was what's called the embargo. If we can't get the British to stop impressment, you might think you would do what the Federalists have done in the 1790s, raise taxes, buy more warships, train some soldiers. No, that's exactly what I said in my first inaugural address we weren't going to do, right? We're not going to do that. What are we going to do instead? We're going to have an embargo. We will just declare that we will not trade with anybody. We won't buy anything from any foreign country. We won't sell anything to any foreigners. We're going to be autarkic. And you might think, well, how could they think this would work? During, of course, in the lead up to the American Revolution, this had happened repeatedly. The British would adopt some new policy, maybe involving taxing the colonies, and the colonies would adopt some kind of boycott, and British wealthy people would complain to their PM or their, their uh, members of Congress, I mean, their members of Parliament, um, this needs to stop, and then the British would rescind this new measure, and a couple of years later, they'd adopt a new one, there'd be another American boycott. But, so Jefferson had gotten into his mind that economic coercion could be a substitute for military power and foreign policy. Actually, I think this idea came to him from Madison, who had it as early as the 1780s. But they were going to give it a real try in 1807 to 1809. Here, remember, James Madison is the Secretary of State in the Jefferson administration. And I do think this was his concept. So <laughs> they try this idea, but there's no way it's going to work because the British are involved in a mammoth world war with the French. The French have the ablest military leader since Alexander, and they, they have a population of 25 million, which in those days was the biggest population of any country's population in Europe. 25 million Frenchmen, 3 million of them are in the army. So Napoleon has these mammoth armies. He's, he's got military control of essentially all of Europe. The, the, the Tsar is an ally of his, and the rest of it he's dominating. In, uh, directly. Meanwhile, the British control the seas. They've destroyed the French and Spanish navies, and they've got control of the seas. So which of them, which of those two countries could be made to change its trade policy by an American boycott? If Napoleon could cross the channel, he would conquer England. Napoleon's only obstacle to domination of the whole European world was Britain. He wasn't going to change his trade policy. Who could be hurt by the Republican boycott the embargo? The answer is Americans. Americans could be hurt by the embargo. Americans were hurt enormously by the embargo. And in fact, so much hurt were the Americans by the embargo that there ended up being large-scale open trading by people in the New England colonies in New York with Canada. Canada, aka that part of Britain just north of us, right? So that they're provisioning British soldiers uh, with with uh, crops that are being grown in Connecticut and Massachusetts and fish that's fished for in, uh, by people from Rhode Island and Massachusetts and so on. So this is a total flop. It does not work at all. After a while, Gallatin, the Secretary of Treasury, i.e. the fellow who's responsible for enforcing the embargo, sent Jefferson a long letter. You might think, why are they all these letters? Don't, don't, they all live in the same town. Why do they write these letters all the time? The answer is, People thought, they knew, being in tidewater during the hot season was very unhealthy. That's why James Madison had gone to uh, Princeton instead of William & Mary. He thought going to Williamsburg would make him sick. So he went to Princeton instead. And while they were president, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe absented themselves from Washington, D.C. for months at a time in the summer because they thought being in, in tidewater would make them sick. So anyway, there, there's, a, there's an exchange between Secretary Gallatin and President Jefferson over the embargo. He says, 
We have people who are smuggling. They're getting past the embargo. If I were going to enforce it, and he lays out a long list of new powers he had to be, he'd have to be given and new people he'd have to hire and new places he'd have to put them. And if you know that Galton was essentially a libertarian and you read this letter, you'd think he's saying to his friend, Tom, stop it already. It doesn't work. But instead, Jefferson more or less takes the letter and sends it to his, his allies in Congress and says, give Galton all these new powers which he did, which they did. So by the end of the Jefferson administration, it's still not working. We have more or less police powers being exercised by the federal government, all the major port cities. Jefferson decides, I've had enough of it. I'm not going to do what, you sh what you'd think you would do, which is change course, because that would involve saying, well, maybe I wasn't exactly right about what John Adams was doing in the 1790s, right? Maybe I was a little bit off. So he goes home to Monticello for the last several months of his administration. And then we have a long letter from Gallatin and Madison, both signing it. So both the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Treasury sign a long letter to Jefferson saying, here are all the various problems that have come up in the government. We need you to be here because you're the president. And he writes back and says, eh, I think this is the kind of thing that's going to affect my successors, so I'm gonna leave it to them. By this point, Madison's been elected president. Have fun, guys. So he has in mind, probably what will happen is Madison will be inaugurated. Galton will be elevated to Secretary of State. It'll be their problem. Why not start now? Jefferson literally dropped out at the end of his term because he did not want to go back on this foreign policy initiative he had undertaken. So Madison follows him as Secretary of, uh, uh, from Secretary of State to President. And this is one of several instances of its kind in American history. We had John Adams following Washington. We had Van Buren following Jackson. We had Johnson following Lincoln. We had Truman following Roosevelt. We had Daddy Bush following Reagan, right? The, the great man and then that other guy. Madison's the other guy. People don't realize that Madison's really the brains behind the operation to a large degree. But when Madison comes into this, uh, it's clear virtually from the beginning that he, He's, he's not the other guy. He's not the, he's not the center of the party. Um, people who saw him give his inaug first inaugural address said he was trembling when he began to speak. He couldn't understand exactly what he's saying. He was saying it in a very low voice, and it wasn't very impressive. I wrote a book about Madison once, and I uh, repeat in the book one sentence from his first inaugural address, which is 264 words long. Right? So you think, why are you oppressing your readers that way? <laughs> the answer is just to give you an idea. Right? So I didn't mention that during the embargo, Madison had written a lengthy pamphlet about how immoral the British policy was with hopes that, in hopes that the British policymakers would read about how much the embargo was hurting the Americans and decide, oh, we should change our policy. No, they weren't going to be persuaded. So um, Madison's... Uh, Madison's presidency gets off to a weak start, a halting start, and then he immediately makes a major error in, a, in the second task as president. First is giving the inaugural address. Second is choosing cabinet members. He had the idea, as Jefferson did, that Madison, number two in the Jefferson administration, would go up to number one, and then number, number three guy, Galton, would move up to number two. But when Madison ran it by his allies in the Senate, one of them, Virginian, Wilson Carey Nicholas wrote Madison a letter and said, I've sounded out other senators, and it seems that if you nominated Gallatin, his nomination would not be confirmed. Right? It would not be confirmed. Then you might think, could that be? The Senate is overwhelmingly Republican. This is going to be the first thing the new Republican president does, and his allies are going to vote it down. Why not just go ahead and try it anyway? But Madison opts for preemptive surrender. Instead, he said, okay, well, one, one way to look at this is he knows that if he keeps, if he keeps Gallatin at Treasury, at least Gallatin will be still in the cabinet with him. He can still count on having his advice. But imagine you're Gallatin and this happens to you, right? How long are you going to want to stay in the government? This is pretty insulting. So anyway, uh, Madison takes this Virginia senator's advice and does not raise Gallatin up to the second position. Instead, he appoints to be his Secretary of State, 
the brother of one of these senators who had, one of the Republican senators who had told Nicholas he would oppose Gallatin. Uh, so these fellows, the Smiths from Maryland, are going to be a real pain in the neck to Madison through his presidency. By the time Smith, the secretary, finishes his tenure as secretary of state, um, a lot of what's being uh, said by, or a lot of what's being sent out over his name is being written by Madison. Madison's doing both the work of the president and the work of the secretary of state. They have uh, several months in which there's still hope in the Madison administration that somehow the British will change their policy, the trade policy toward the United States would drop the impressment idea. Finally, Madison decides it's not going to happen. In June of 1812, he sends a lengthy message to Congress describing various offenses the British have committed against the Americans, concluding with his saying, and so in fine, we have a situation in which the United Kingdom is at war with the United States, but the United States are not at war with the United Kingdom. You might want to think what to do about that. Now we might think that kind of captures a, a bit of a defect in executive leadership. Now that would be the harsh way to read that. Another way to read that would be Madison thinks he's the chief executive. He doesn't think it's his role to declare war on Britain. He doesn't think it's his role to say, you need to declare war on Britain. He thinks it's for Congress to decide on declaration of war with Britain. I tend to think the latter, but the former I think would be a reasonable conclusion. Anyway, they have a lengthy debate in each house of Congress. The one in the Senate lasts longer. They end up with the narrowest ever margins for a declaration of war in American history, the narrowest ever margins. One person, one Republican who had been opposed to the declaration of war is supposed to have said, you're, you're thinking of declaring war in Britain. You have no ships, you have no men, you have no money. What are you doing? He, here's the answer to that. Former President Jefferson, writing to a, a mutual ally of his and Madison's, said, I think a war with the British would be a matter of just a few weeks marching. So what he thought, what Jefferson thought, and apparently this is what Madison thought was, the United States would declare war. It would march an army into Canada. Meanwhile, ships are slowly waking their way across the Atlantic. The British don't know this is happening yet. The Americans would take uh, Quebec. They'd take Montreal. And then the British would get news war had been declared. And then they would end up negotiating some kind of an arrangement under the terms of which the, Brit the Americans would return Canada to the British. The British would agree never to close Europe or Britain or Britain's territories to American shipping again and never to impress American sailors. Well, that seems to have been what they hoped for. But it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Instead, the War of 1812 was just gruesome. It was just so badly run. The American military secretaries, that is the Secretary of the Navy and the Secretary of the Army, were completely unfit. In fact, the fellow who was appointed to be the first Navy secretary in the Madison administration, a fellow from South Carolina named Paul Hamilton, apparently was such so overwhelmed with dipsomania that he would be in, incapacitated by noon every day. Every day he would go to his office and he would be so drunk by noon that he could not function. People knew this. You might think, why did they appoint him? We'll get back to that in a minute. <laughs> um, the fellow who, whom Madison appointed to be his first war secretary, what today would be the secretary of the army, um, his qualification for this position was that he had been a surgeon in the Continental Army during the Revolution. Okay, we're talking about 1809. The Revolution ended in 1783. But even if it had ended last week, you wouldn't think being a surgeon would qualify you to be Secretary of War, right? So <laughs> the generals, too, the, gen the people who were supposed to be leading American soldiers in the field in the War of 1812, with a couple of exceptions, William Henry Harrison, who was competent, Andrew Jackson, who was also competent, maybe a little better than competent. Um, Besides those two, the generals were just as bad as the Navy and war secretaries. There, one example uh, was a fellow named Hull who ended up losing uh, his army in the Midwest 
he apparently before that happened had been seen by his soldiers um, on a horse, losing control of his horse, falling off the saddle, holding onto the saddle horn. You know, people called him Granny after that, right? Granny, that's our inspiring leader, right? So we have several, and actually the same hull um, was in an American um, palisaded area when he heard enemy cannon fire, and he was so overcome with fear of the cannons that he squatted in a corner and began ranting uncontrollably about the civilians who were in encampment, right? Imagine if that were the general in charge of your force when you were being attacked, right? This, I'm not choosing these people because they're the worst. They're just the ones who come to mind at this moment, right? It was just pitiful. It, the, the leadership of the American military in the War of 1812 was pitiful. There were a few outstanding isolated es, uh, exploits of the Navy that remained famous. In fact, one significant naval accomplishment of the War of 1812 led to the clearing by the mutual agreement between Britain and the United States of the Great Lakes of naval assets. So since the War of 1812, essentially the border between the United States and Canada is undefended on both sides. It is the longest undefended border anywhere in the world in history, right? This is a major, obviously, this is a major accomplishment. And famously, Andrew Jackson's victory at New Orleans was a major accomplishment. Um, so what, but you might think if you're my age, maybe if you're older, you might think, but when I was a kid, I was told that the Vietnam War was the first war the United States lost. So how did the Americans win the war? The answer is, well, here's what really happened. Uh, in 1814, were, the people in New England had become so resistant to the war effort that the legislature of Massachusetts called for a convention to be held at Hartford, the capital of Connecticut. And it called for the other state governments in Connecticut to send delegates to Hartford. And what they were going to do was to discuss the future of the American Union. And people who were not from New England thought, well, this is a secession convention. And there actually had been discussion of secession in New England. The governor of Massachusetts refused to send militiamen when Madison, under his constitutional authority to do this, called for uh, militia to be sent to him to defend the country with. And the governor of Massachusetts was allowing British ships to provision at Martha's Vineyard and on Cape Cod and Nantucket. And the northern part of New England, essentially the whole northern part of New England was, was, had been conquered by the British and was being held by them. So anyway, they have this convention in 1814 in Hartford and people think it's gonna be a secession convention. They decide to meet in secret, but it was not a secession convention. First thing they did was they chose a non-secessionist to be the president. And then they adopted various resolutions about constitutional amendments they wanted. They wanted a constitutional amendment against successive presidents from the same state. <laughs> they wanted a con they were going to get more of that, by the way, of course. They wanted a constitutional amendment against having a president serve more than one term. They wanted a constitutional amendment against economic embargoes. They just wanted an amendment against the whole Republican program and all the Republican people, right? No more Republicans, no more of this Virginia government. That was their idea. Meanwhile, in, in Europe, the British and the Americans had agreed to a treaty. And what the treaty said was, we'll restore the status quo antebellum. You can have all your land back, right? Bygones will be bygones. Meanwhile, in the southernmost part of the United States, uh, Andrew Jackson has... Um, def provided defensive emplacements along various routes of approach to New Orleans. And one of the British generals led a force of Britons across an open field at the other end of which Jackson had had his men space cannons behind trenches where his infantry were. And when the British marched onto that field, they were leveled by cannon fire. The commanding general had his horse shot from under him. He went back to the back, got another horse, uh, rode to the front again. This time he was killed on the battlefield. That was the, that was the Duke of Wellington's brother-in-law, by the way. Um, and so word of the treaty and the Hartford Convention 
And Jackson's victory at New Orleans got to the East Coast more or less at the same time. So the impression this left was, we've won the war. Look what Jackson did at New Orleans. They, they're getting out of our territory and they've agreed not to impress people anymore. And look at these traitorous Federalists at Hartford. So what this came to was the most spectacular political victory the Republicans could ever have dreamed for. Did they deserve it? About that much, right? They did not deserve it. They intentionally disarmed the country and yet they ended up with this result. So what this meant was just that the Republicans were invincible, invincible. By the time James Monroe is up for re-election in 1816, um, no, in 1820, by the time James Monroe is up for re-election in 1820, he gets all but one electoral vote. And the one elector who voted against him was a fellow Republican who just said his personality was inappropriate to the office. In other words, every member of the Electoral College was a Republican in 1820. And you might think, well, James Monroe was really popular. No, he was not really popular. He was not really popular. The, the national turnout in 1820 was about 9%. Nine. In Virginia, it was higher, though. Here, people knew him, so here it was 10%. <laughs> right? People just, ugh, what would you even vote about? There's no reason to vote Federalist, and nobody's going to, so why bother? So James Monroe's reelected. James Monroe's presidency was dubbed by people who had been vociferous Federalists the era of good feelings. Now, you probably heard that term, the era of good feelings. And the reason it was called the era of good feelings was that Monroe decided to uh, recapitulate something that George Washington had done. When George Washington was president, he toured the country. He thought, we have this new government. People never see it. You know, they didn't, the only way you'd ever see the president is if you were looking at him. They didn't have TV, radio, etchings in their newspapers, but you weren't going to see George Washington. So he decided he should travel around the country and show, show the flag. So Monroe decided to do the same thing. And uh, this, this made him popular. There, were hu there was huge turnout in, uh, in the big cities. And it was a newspaper in Boston, formerly the center of the, the Federalist Party, that said, we seem to have entered a, an era of good feelings. That's where Jefferson thought it would be back in that first inaugural address. We shouldn't have parties. We have called by different names, brethren of the same principle. We're all Republicans. We're all Federalists. It seemed that it had come true. And Monroe had done things to keep there from continuing to be party division. This is exactly the outcome he wanted. Thank you. Thank you.